Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the <clears throat> COVID-19 uh, simulation uh, summit. And uh, this has been an event that we've uh, thrown together a little bit quickly in the last few weeks in response to the uh, the the urgent situation with COVID-19. But I, I think uh, we're going to have some really fascinating uh, content. We've got some amazing speakers and panelists live up and, and we're hoping this is not only you know some interesting content for people to listen to but that that we can really really make an imp make an impact here in in how society is modeling and then uh coping with this uh this covid pandemic that that we're all in the middle of uh, as, as i speak so we're we're live streaming this uh on on youtube uh and this will let us get some real time uh, Q and A after each talk and panel, but uh, we, we expect uh, you know majority of viewers will look at the videos, the videos afterwards, and the the topic here is uh, agent based modeling, which is a a way of simulating <clears throat> complex. Uh, biological and social situations where you set up a detailed computer simulation model of the the system society the set of organisms you want to understand you can think about you know video games like sim city or sim earth or sim tower these are sort of an entertainment version of agent based modeling but there there's been more serious in depth accurate versions you know, in use in epidemiology, but also in all sorts of other uh, military, intelligent, government, e econ economics applications. And it's really a more accurate way to simulate a complex system than the alternatives, which are just setting up some high level equations describing a system. In an agent based model, if you're trying to simulate, you know, a bunch of bugs, your software includes a bunch of little simulated bugs that are buzzing around doing things. And you can look at many different systems of simulated bugs and you can you can see what they do. And an agent based model of a system of, of people living in a city. I mean, you set up really a simulation of that city and there's a little software object representing each person and the little simulated people are, are going around and, and, and doing things. And you can experiment with how the different simulated people behave with what kind of environment they're in, what rules they have to obey. You can also have the little simulated people in your agent-based simulation learn and, and reason to a certain extent. And this, uh, this is where agent-based modeling touches on artificial intelligence, which is which is where my, my primary ex expertise is. You can do an agent based model with very simple agents, as was the case in uh, SimCity, SimEarth and other more more uh, modern simulation games. Or you can do an agent based model where the computational agents, you know, even if they're not as smart as, as people or anything, they're able to learn and reason and, and adapt. And this can get more and more accurate modeling so we're we're going to have an amazing set of speakers exploring different aspects of agent-based modeling as applied to understanding COVID-19 and the potential impact of various COVID-19 policies and uh yeah I'll tell you a bit about each of the speakers uh a little later in this uh introductory talk and then you know I'll, I'll be uh spending the day engaged with this online event and uh, introducing each of the speakers uh, as, as, as they come on and, and helping with the, the, the Q&A sessions. So, you know, the, the motivation for organizing this, this event by uh, myself, my colleagues at uh, Decentralized AI Alliance, uh, SingularityNet and all the other organizations that, that have been helping, I mean, I guess it should be pretty obvious, right? I mean, COVID-19 is, uh, it's disrupting all of our lives to a remarkable degree. And we can, we can see it's wreaking a lot of havoc, causing a lot of damage in the world. And, you know, I, want, I wanted to see, we all wanted to see what we could do with the resources and knowledge at our disposal to help with the, help with the, the situation. And agent-based modeling clearly is, one way that the 
AI community and the computer science community can can help with with, with COVID nineteen. I mean, it's certainly not the only way. I've also been looking at using some of our bioinformatics AI at SingularityNet to help discover new therapies for COVID, to help with precision medicine, to understand who the therapies currently being tested will work for, but making intelligent agent-based simulations. This is one way that those of us in the AI and computer science side can help with COVID. And then on the, on the blockchain side, which is another thing we do in SingularityNet, you know, blockchain can help with collecting data to feed into simulation models in the way that respects privacy and, and, and data sovereignty. But so that's really the core motive for myself and really everybody else involved in organizing and, and speaking here is, you know, what can we do given what we know to, to help with the current situation? It's also the case secondarily that this is just a, you know, it's a very interesting intellectual puzzle. COVID-19, it's an unprecedented situation and there's something to learn just in terms of AI and agent-based modeling by seeing what we can do with, a, with our current tools to, to grapple with this, this complex and, and deadly serious puzzle that, that we're, all, we're all confronted with. I mean, if you, if you look around at the world now, what you can see is social policy decisions you know which are costing trillions of dollars and they're disrupting the lives of almost everybody on the planet these social policy decisions regarding the control of covid-19 spread these are being made currently based on very 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 simple modeling and, and analysis methods i mean this is almost shocking given there's trillions or tens of trillions of dollars and given the almost unprecedented or really unprecedented things that are happening like everyone's sitting at home in their house all, all the restaurants are shut down you know the almost all flights are shut down these these are huge decisions with huge impacts and you know they've been made on the basis of an extremely simplistic understanding of the of the situation and you know as a matter of historical fact this may have been the right thing to do certainly when COVID-19 was first spreading we didn't have the knowledge that we now have about the nature of the of the disease I mean it could have ended up based on our knowledge in in December and January it could have ended up even more deadly and dangerous than, than, it, than it's been now but regardless of what you think about the decision process so far uh, up up to up till now I mean now we do have a certain level of knowledge about COVID-19 virus. We have a certain level of knowledge about its impact, how, how deadly it is and what, what, what its, its limitations are as, as, a, as a viral killer. We've seen something about the impact of, of certain policies and the, the lack of impact of certain other policies. We now have the data and the understanding to drive a much more fine grained approach to modeling the spread of, of COVID. And I think it, it really behooves us to pursue more accurate and in-depth modeling of, of COVID spread because, you know, we're not just going to be able to relax the sometimes draconian policies that are in place to combat COVID right now immediately. There, there's likely to be a gradual relaxation of policies. There could be resurgences of, of COVID spread, which necessitate new policies being put into place. We need a more solid, more grounded scientific process for making all these decisions. I mean, we'll have questions like, how long does social distancing need to stay in place in, in, in a certain region to really have, have, have its impact? If you let a certain class of people, you know, social distance less than others, say school children, I mean, how much impact is, is, is that gonna have? How much impact would you have on, on reducing the death toll by, by more effectively managing nursing homes and, and, and more, more effectively keeping the elderly and immunocompromised out, 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 out of harm's way and, and, and focusing on that as more of an emphasis than, than widespread social distancing and shutdowns? I mean, how, how useful are travel bans really when the travel is between places that already have a lot of, of, of COVID in them. I mean, there's a lot of questions that we just don't have a fine-grained answer to, but we have to make fine-grained decisions, right? So 
making detailed decisions like when, when do you open the beaches when do you open school do you do you allow kids to go to school only for for half day do you open elementary school and not high school what's an essential business we have to make fine-grained decisions and to make fine-grained decisions there, there's an argument that fine-grained models may be the the appropriate tool i mean that at the much higher level than these fine-grained decisions like, you know, should we open elementary school before high school? You know, I I was in mainland China in January for, for the Spring Festival, Chinese New Year, visiting my wife's family uh, when, when COVID was first spreading through China. Uh, I've been based in Hong Kong for eight years. So I, I, I was in Hong Kong in February. I was in South Korea for a little while. I've, I, I've been here in uh, Washington State near near Seattle for the last four or five weeks. So I've seen very different ways of managing COVID across these, these different places. So in Hong Kong, you know, businesses don't have to be just essential to stay open. Re rest restaurants are open. Some business meetings are still happening. W Washington State has been far more locked down. Now, each of these approaches has had pluses and minuses. What strikes me is no one's done a really careful modeling analysis of the costs and benefits of the of the of these different approaches. It it's hard because Hong Kong is not the same as as, as Washington State. But just because modeling and, and understanding the implications and costs and benefits of these policies is hard, doesn't mean we should we shouldn't do it. I mean the, the human and economic cost being incurred here is enough that that uh, you know we should be undertaking the the hard task of doing the in-depth modeling to really, really understand what's what, what's going on. And I think agent-based modeling isn't magic. I mean, given our limited understanding of the, uh, the virus itself and our, 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 the limited detail of our, our model of, of human behavior in a complex society, I mean, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't do everything. We can't do a complete prediction of, of what people are going to do under this or that policy choice. But I think, I think we can answer a lot of questions a lot, a lot better than, than we're doing, we're doing right now. And I mean, among the questions that I think we'd like to explore, you know, as society starts to open up a bit, so relax social distancing rules, op op open some parks. I mean, how, how does the disease spread really depend on this, on this gradual opening? I mean, there's, there's a threshold in epidemiology related to the basic reproduction number, like is the exponent above one or, or less than one, which, which, which governs whether the spreading is you know, exponential like, like wildfire or whether the epidemic will eventually peter out. But, you know, in a complex society with many different people with different characteristics who can adapt based on what they observe and have different movement patterns, just looking at the basic reproduction number isn't, isn't good enough. And it's not clear whether as we gradually open up and relax shutdowns and social distancing, it's not clear whether as you gradually open up you know the 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 spread of the virus will react gradually to that, or is there some threshold where you can gradually open up to a certain level? But if you go beyond that too fast, then suddenly that has a much larger larger impact. There's all sorts of nonlinearities like this in in complex systems, and we can study those with agent based modeling. And the alternative is just to try and see what happens, which is pretty much what's happening in in human society now, which has obvious, obvious downsides. And I mean, my, yeah, my sister is a, is a school principal and she's, she's facing questions. Nobody knows the answer to, to every day. Like, should the, you know, should they initially open school half day rather than, rather than full day? Like what difference does that actually make given the fact that children may not fully obey like staying six feet away from each other in school 
even even if you ask them to. So it's it's taking into account you know differences in behavior between elementary school children and uh, and high school children and and adults. To, and the, the specific sizes of those populations and how much they interact with each other, taking into account particulars like that <clears throat> is the sort of thing agent-based models are really, really good at. And I think there's, you know, there, there's an argument you could make that, you know, some of our government decision makers are, are operating in, in very limited cognitive bandwidth. So it's hard enough just to get the simplest possible understanding of the, of the pandemic uh, through the heads of, of some of our, our political leaders and, and decision makers. I mean, not, not to, to name any names here. So I mean, there's an argument that some of the decision making processes have such limited cognitive bandwidth, we shouldn't even try to throw complex models at them. But I, I think I think we need to look at it in a sort of uh, graded way. Yes, I mean, the most important thing politically and in terms of policy is to make sure very simple basic understanding is gotten out there and is in infusing policy. And indeed, this isn't always the case anywhere, which is, is, is ridiculous. On the other hand, there are fine-grained and specific uh, decisions to be made and there are you know rational scientific data driven decision makers like say governor inslee here in, in washington state who are looking at data and looking at the best available models and making reasoned decisions based on them and you know when you have fine-grained decisions to be made made by rational thoughtful people you need fine-grained models to to drive them and we have that technology i mean agent based modeling it's not unknown in epidemiology there there's published papers recounting some of its uh, successes in the epidemiology field you know it's not used as frequently as simpler uh, differential equations models of epidemic flow just cuz it's it's more complex there's a lot of parameters to tune it can use a lot of, of computing time but I mean, we're dealing with a pandemic whose social policy implications are costing the global economy trillions, tens of trillions of dollars. So I mean, the cost of using more sophisticated modeling should, should not be material here if we can use it to obtain much more accurate estimates of the likely implications of, the, of, of policy decisions. And you know, as well as the use by policy makers, we can use agent-based modeling to help individuals guide guide their own decisions, say to estimate their own likelihood of contracting COVID-19 based on their own behaviors. You know, how much more likely will I be to contract the virus if I go for, for a hike with a, with a few of my friends rather than, than just uh, with, 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 my, with my wife and kid? Uh, how much danger is my mom incurring by, by going into, into the office a few times a week rather than just, just working at home? I mean, she's, a, she's an essential worker. So, I mean, again, we can't come up with perfect 100% solid answers to these questions for almost any of us. On the other hand, uh, an in-depth agent-based model could help us answer these questions better than, than we're able to answer them, answer them right now. And so we're driven in the work that's gonna be presented in the conference today by the, the desire to use agent-based modeling as a technique to help guide policy, you know, during during the next twelve to eighteen months of the COVID nineteen uh, situation, which is the best estimate I've seen of how long it will be until a vaccine is widely available. But it's also important to note the same techniques, the same kind of agent based modeling framework, can be used for other future pandemics and you know also other situations besides pandemics, because an in depth agent based model of society and how people how people interact has a lot of other 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 uses as well i mean we we don't want a repeat of the current situation where vastly expensive and, and tremendously impactful social policies are determined based on crude models you know political gamesmanship and just people people's intuition we want to be able to address future pandemics and future social crises with accurate scientific models you know right 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 from the start and by building agent based models of 
COVID-19, we're also laying the foundation for, you know, more intelligent agent-based modeling of any, any future situation. So I'm, uh, I'm going to give another talk at the end of this event, just talking a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in SingularityNet regarding agent-based modeling, working toward effective agent-based modeling of, of COVID-19. But really the, the main point I had in, in working with my, my colleagues to pull together this uh, summit is not to talk about just what we're doing at Singularity Net, but to, to talk about you know all the other important work and, and thinking going on in the world toward agent-based modeling and see if we can agglomerate together you know more of the epidemiology community, the medical community, the agent-based modeling world, the policy world. Can we agglomerate together you know more of the of the thought power and action power in the world to really get accurate agent-based modeling of, of, of COVID-19 done. So yeah, we got an amazing assemblage of, of uh, speakers. Uh, Robin Hansen from uh, George Mason U University. You know, he's, he's an economist who has an amazing track record of uh, using economic thinking to explore all sorts of topics outside the, the domain that the typical economist works with. I mean, I mean, we've talked a bunch about his his modeling of the economics of a potential technological singularity. Here he, he's going to talk a bit about some alternative approaches to managing, managing COVID-19 uh, variolation where people agree to be infected by low doses of, 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 of COVID so, so that, uh, you know, they can maybe gain immunity or they can also, if they do get sick, they're not overwhelming the medical system at the wrong time, and uh, you know, vouching that you you have have been infected as a way to get certain privileges. I mean, these are these are very controversial perspectives, but I think one of the beauties of doing modeling is you can explore controversial, even maybe crazy perspectives in a in a simulation context without without inflicting ideas that aren't fully baked on on the on the on the broader world. Uh, we'll have. Uh, Yanir Baryam, who I've known for many decades now, who's been sort of a, a leading light in complex simulation modeling uh, ar ar around the world. He runs the New England Complex Systems Institute. He did pioneering models of the global financial system, you know, b before the, the last financial crisis. And in some ways, for, for, for seeing that, he's led complex systems modeling in biology, sociology, all, all over the place. And he he really is a master of, you know, formulating and proposing simple models in a way that policymakers can understand and then act on, as well as exploring more complex and, and in-depth in models that really get get to the heart of the of the subtlety of complex systems phenomena. We'll have uh, Petronio Candido, a, a Brazilian uh, computer science professor, who's created a wonderful uh, open source agent-based simulation model of COVID-19 and put it out there on, on, on the internet, thus uh, you know, getting, out, getting out the word about the value of agent-based modeling to the, to the software development community. And we've, uh, we've in SingularityNet extended his simulation model and been porting it to the Python Mesa, Mesa framework. And uh, yeah, it's been a fascinating initial practical step, step forward. We'll have uh, Ray and, and Roger Unga from uh, Nth Opinion, who are, you know, frontline doctors helping COVID-19 patients uh, right now. And since that, that uh, you know, doesn't keep them, keep them busy enough, I mean, they're, they're also pushing forward with, with Nth Opinion, which is a, a medical information service intended to, to provide uh, end users with, with accurate answers to questions about, about, about COVID provided by doctors, and they've they've been engaged with uh, some of my Singularity Net colleagues and colleagues from Ocean Protocol in the COVIDathon, the, the COVID nineteen online decentralized AI hackathon that, that that we've been that we've been organizing, and I think uh, you know it's important to have not just academic modelers and thinkers, but some physicians who are out there out there 
in, in, in the field and, and really, really un understand COVID from the, the, the hands-on point of view and, and the, you know, the, the, the damage it, 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 it can wreak. We have uh, Eva Lee, who's been doing in-depth uh, simulation modeling uh, funded by US government for some time. She has a program called RealOpt that does you know, detailed models for strategic planning and operational response of uh, dealing with outbreaks, pandemics, not national disasters, integrating with the uh, geographical information systems and, and economic data. So, I mean, she's been working on these huge complex simulation models, bringing all sorts of different, different, different data together, including agent-based along, along with other, other paradigms. And has been applying these to epidemiology as well as other, other areas for, for, some time and uh, yeah it'll be very very interesting to hear uh, you know what what she's been able to learn from these models and what she sees as, as the next steps there and then finally we'll have one of my colleagues uh debbie duong who you know i worked with debbie 15 to 20 years ago when i was based in washington dc among other things doing agent-based modeling for various u.s u.s government agencies you know modeling uh irregular warfare and, and the other sorts of situations. But these same modeling techniques that Debbie Duong has, has been using, uh, you know, for decades in modeling healthcare system, in modeling various military and intelligence situations. I mean, these same modeling techniques can be used to handle uh, COVID-19 and she's gonna present some preliminary results of the modeling she's been, been doing, applying agent-based tools to, to COVID uh, in, in, the, in the last, few weeks and uh, you know we, we also have a a panel that will be led by uh, by uh, G Gina Smith and you know the, the 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 panel features folks with a uh, epidemiology blockchain uh, medical backgrounds and uh, we're going to see a whole bunch of different perspectives brought to bear on on the detailed and and uh, in-depth thinking and and and, and results uh, presented by our speakers. So yeah, I'm really excited that we've managed to convene this uh, amazing collection of uh, experts on, on fairly short notice to spend the day talking about simulation modeling and agent modeling for COVID and giving so much input to feed into the, into the simulation models, because really, you know, this isn't just about like how do you code an agent-based simulation model or how do you make it run fast on the on the computing resources available. It's about what assumptions do you feed into the agent-based simulation model? Like what what questions do you pose to the simulation model? How do you use the simulation model to drive policy? So we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about all these aspects. Uh, it's gonna be both, you know, a wild ride intellectually and and more importantly we may be able to bring some collaborations together and connect some concepts together that, that actually can be can be helpful in, in more effectively modeling this uh, pandemic that is uh, you know causing so much death and, and destruction and, and screwing with all our lives so I think uh, we may have just a couple minutes to take a couple questions if there are any Yes, hi everyone. First of all, thank you for um, being so enthusiastic about the event and the band's talk and thanks a lot for everyone's question. I think we have a few questions that uh, the community would like to ask you, Ben. Um, I'm going to start with the first one from uh, Mihaela, and I hope I'm going to pronounce it uh, correctly. Uh, so, as governments struggle to reconcile several pressures to support both healthcare cost, unemployment support, retirement pension, economic stimulation, et cetera. All this cost and with a shrinking economy and less tax revenues. Can agent-based modeling help in any way with such a con conundrum? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, agent-based modeling certainly can help with uh, with any situation where you where you have uh, 
you know, a number of, of different agents interacting in, in, in complex ways in a, in a, in a, com in a complex in environment. So, yeah, I mean, for, I mean, we're talking within singularity net, which isn't the main focus of this, of this event, but it, it's, it's, it's where, uh, where I have direct experience. I mean, within singularity net, we're now talking to a couple large enterprises who want to model say enterprise social distancing and, and want to model the, the impact of COVID-19 on the on their supply chain in, in in various contexts. And they have a huge amount of data about their company and everything relevant to it. We've also been talking to, you know, a, a major Asian government about, uh, you know, using using modeling of COVID-19 and its impact on their society as, as they open up, using that as a sort of uh, initial case to a more thoroughgoing uh, AI, AI model of their whole government and, and, and their whole country, right? So I, I think uh, in, 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 some, in some sense, agent-based modeling of companies and enterprises and, and countries, as well as people's lives with the future of managing COVID-19, in some cases, this can not only deliver amazing near-term value, but can also be a lead-in to doing more intelligent modeling of, of all these, these human and economic systems in, in, a, in, in a broader sense. And yeah, then when you look at when you look at the path from narrow AI toward artificial general intelligence, I mean you 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 can see the possibility of using agent-based modeling in these complex human systems as as one way to lead your AI sort of along the path toward AGI, which is a very a very interesting path because it would lead to an AGI with a deep understanding of, of human systems as as well as a as a measure of general intelligence. Another question from uh, John Miranda: Have you reached out already to work with government agencies? Yeah, we're we're talking to government agencies in a in a few different countries now, and there is there's interest, but uh, so far, I mean, we we, have, we haven't seen movement at the speed I would like. But I mean, I'm used to like uh, AI and blockchain world where things move move really really fast, and I, I, I think after after the the wheels turn a little more i, I think we're we're going to see some practical as well as uh, theoretical interest in in this work by government agencies and in, in a, a number of different countries another question from uh, scroller, scroller. Uh, what do governments currently get wrong about simulations Well, that would be that would be a very very what, what governments currently get wrong would be a very very long long list, which would uh, would take more more time than we have. But I, I would say, in 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 general, you know, governments are not typically the best at bringing together like cross disciplinary tech geeks of the top of the top caliber to solve really hard problems and to get agent based modeling right. I mean, you, you, you need experts on the domain being modeled. I mean, and you need people who know about simulation modeling and AI, and you need people who know about, you know, scalable high performance computing to, to run big simulations and bringing people with all these expertises together into an, an effective group to rapidly deploy complex models. I mean, that's, that's not the kind of thing that most government agencies have been good at. It's the kind of thing that big tech companies have been good at, but they haven't been focusing on this on this problem. So I think governments have tended to rely on really, really simplistic models just just because of the way the way governments operate. And you can see that in other domains too. Like who has who has a better you know risk model of the global economy? I mean, Goldman Sachs or, or, or U.S. government. Government is good at doing some things, but really complex. Uh, large-scale informatics modeling isn't one of them. Uh, last question is a little bit more technical. It comes from uh, Makita, and uh, he or she is asking, uh, what are the best agent-based simulation packages and tools, or just program your own case-specific application? Well, there's a lot of good agent-based simulation packages, and 
and tools. I would say that what we're using within SingularityNet is a Python toolkit called, called Mesa, which uh, is pretty simple and easy to use as many Python frameworks are, but yet it, it lets you behind the scenes do things in, in, in a very uh, you know, large scale and, and, and scalable way. So we've been, we've been having good success playing with, uh, with Mesa, but that's not to say there's not other great frameworks out there also. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions from the community while we wait for the next speaker, Yanir, to join us. Um, so on, on the fun side, someone is asking, if you ever felt like an agent walking around in a land of guns, GANs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Short answer. Yeah. Okay, Yanir will join us soon. Uh, in the meantime, if the community has any more questions for Ben, feel free. To, uh, to send them over. Another question from Scroller. How do you feel about Silicon Valleyism in the current pandemic? 10 companies do understand better how to approach simulation, but you risk the Silicon Valley, but the risk is the Silicon Valleyism. Do you agree? Oh, I mean, Silicon Valley, I mean, speaking of the, the US tech industry more broadly, rather than that, that specific location, I mean, obviously, there's been tremendous value and, and innovation to, to come out of the US, US tech industry. But it has been, I mean, it's been areas that are sort of off to the side of, of dealing with a, with, with, with a pandemic, right? So I mean, I've seen I've seen some media, media articles of people put, putting down the, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so forth, saying like the, these big companies thought they could solve every problem there is, but now they're not helping us cure a pandemic. But I mean, sure, that's 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 not what these these companies were 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 set up for. So I, I don't I don't I don't hold it against big Silicon Valley companies that they're delivering the products that they that they. Uh, that they are rather than dealing with it with a with a pandemic. What worries me is not their response right now. And you know, I'm really glad right now to have Amazon to deliver stuff and Google to find stuff online. I think the, these services are they're they're fantastic. What what's what's worrying me is that the dynamics of societies and economies reaction to COVID-19 may cause to increase, you know, concentration of wealth and power, both in society as a whole and, and in, in, in the technology industry in, in particular. And you can see this, you can see this in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. And that's not really Silicon Valley companies fault. I mean, that, that's the way modern capitalism is structured, right? So you, you're seeing a lot of service workers laid off now and of the service workers being laid off in the pandemic, not all are going to be hired back. I mean, for a lot of reasons, like many people will get used to ordering groceries online and will keep doing it. And then, then you won't need as many as many supermarket clerks, right? So you, 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 you won't necessarily see, uh, you know, fast food restaurants may more rapidly roll out automation tools for the drive through windows. So you don't end up needing to hire back all those people sitting behind the drive through window. There's, there's going to be a lot of different dynamics via which, you know, some of these service jobs that are being shut down now aren't coming back. And on, on the other hand, people in so-called uh, knowledge industry jobs are able to keep on working from home and their jobs are mostly going to, going to still be there. Right. So, I mean, I, I think, uh, you're going to see an exacerbation of income inequality coming out of this. We're also seeing, you know, some well-capitalized funds are 
buying stuff up cheaply now while while folks are are, are desperate and then they're going to have an increased ownership stake of the economy after this is done and even within within the realm of tech startups like anyone who needs funding for their startup now well founder friendly terms are kind of out the window right so you know vcs are going to have stronger control of companies they're investing in now vcs on the whole tend to push for acquisition exits and so so then we're looking at big companies being able to be more and more and more dominant going forward alongside government you know getting more and more control of people's data for the the valid end of of helping to track track the pandemic so that yeah there, there, there's a risk that this leads to more concentration of, of wealth and power which is uh is un unfortunate and there may be ways to combat that using you know open source uh, blockchain and other technologies but i'll touch on that in my next talk because it is now time for me to turn things over to the uh the amazing uh Yanir, Yanir, uh, Yanir Baryam, who's, uh, who, who's our next speaker.